Hi, I'm Stefan Lewandowski. I'm a cognitive scientist at the University of Western Australia in Perth. As a cognitive scientist, I study how the mind works. I work on how people think, how they remember things, and how they make decisions. And one of my recent research interests has dealt with climate change. I've been concerned with how people process data about climate change. I've been interested in what makes people accept the evidence for climate change or what makes them reject that evidence. And today what I'm going to talk about is my research on these issues in addition to a number of other studies that people have done. For example, whether people are swayed by anecdotes more than by scientific evidence and what the um, political factors are that make people either accept or reject science and how we might change people's attitudes about climate change. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, what I want to talk about today is just a um, give you an overview of the cognition of climate change, how people think about climate change, how their attitudes are determined, and how all that interacts with uh, policy. Now, uh, there have been increasing calls from geophysicists that it's time for the social scientists to take over and explain to them why it is that when the problem is so clear to them, uh, the public opinion seems to be lagging behind. So um, what I want to do today then is to heed that call and go through some of the psychological and cognitive factors. Uh, oh. That wasn't, this is better. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so what I want to talk about today, this is the roadmap of my uh, talk today, is to tell you a little bit about uh, public opinion and then try to understand why it is that since about 2007, 2008, there has been, at least in the US, a decline in acceptance of climate change, uh, at least until recently. This graph stops a couple of years ago. There has been a considerable uptick again, but nonetheless, there has been this decline in public acceptance. Now, uh, in Australia, um, I have some data here from CSIRO from a couple of years ago. In Australia, we have a similar situation where about half the population uh, accepts that climate change is happening and that it is caused by human greenhouse gas emissions. There's another very large chunk of the population, about 40%, who accept that the climate is changing, but they think it is all natural. And then we have a sliver of people here who deny everything, about 5.6%, who don't think it's happening, and obviously then we have nothing to do with it if it is not happening. Now, I want to show you a bit more about these, these two large segments of the population here because I think it's very important to bear in mind that um, people's opinions about climate change aren't always what they appear to be at first glance. Now, what I'm showing you here are responses for the group in green who accept the scientific evidence in full that the climate is changing and that we're causing it, uh, and here in gray are the other 40% of the people who think the climate is changing, but it's all natural. Now what this graph is showing you are the responses of those two groups of people to the question of who is responsible for climate change. And the options given here are big polluting countries, multinational corporations, wealthy countries, and so on, and so on. Now, what is remarkable about this graph, to my mind, is how similar those two response profiles are between the green bars and the gray bars. And in particular, what I find remarkable is that for the people who think that climate change is all natural, they're the ones in gray, if you ask them who's responsible, they know exactly who's responsible. Because they're telling you it's big polluting countries. It is multinational corporations, wealthy countries. So they know who's responsible for something that seconds ago they said was all natural. Now I think that's a very important realization because it tells us that uh, what's happened with climate change is that to some extent it's become a political football and a tribal totem 
and depending on their party affiliation, people will say, yeah, 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 it's all natural, when in fact they know quite well, as shown in this graph, who is responsible. There's one other thing I want to draw your attention to uh, from these data for Australia from a couple of years ago, and that is the overestimation of the few people who deny that climate change is happening. Remember, that was only 5 or 6% of the um, population at large. If you ask those people how many others in society share their own opinion, what you find is that these guys think half the population is sharing their opinion. So here we have a 5% fringe who think half the population shares their opinion, and who think that only a little more than 15% of the population believes that climate change is due to human greenhouse gas emissions. This is known as a false consensus effect, and it refers to the fact that people who are very much in the minority mistakenly think that others share their opinion to a great extent. Now, the reason that's relevant is because it turns out that this discrepancy this overestimation of one's own opinion has been shown to be related to a resistance towards attitude change. So it's important to understand that these few people think their opinion is shared by lots of others. So this is just a background snapshot of the public opinion sphere in Australia. Now let me move on by talking about the supply and the demand side of what could be called denial or the rejection of climate science, which is perhaps a better term. Let me just very briefly talk about the supply side. How do the people who are communicating doubts about climate change, how do they operate? Well, I've done some research on that, which is unpublished as yet, but I thought it might be interesting to share with you anyway. This is just one example of a quote from the Heartland Institute some years ago, who said that National Snow and Ice Data Center records show conclusively that in April 2009, Arctic sea ice extent has returned and surpassed 1989 levels. Therefore, don't worry about anything. Buy your SUV and fill it up and have fun. Um, well, that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Except. If you look at the data, uh, these are the actual data of Arctic sea ice extent between 1989 and 2009. Now, most people would agree that that's kind of declining. So why then and how does the Heartland Institute make this statement? Well, let's look at the statement again. And let's have a closer look. Ooh, they say April 2009, don't they? Not 2009, but April 2009. I wonder why. Let's look at the data on a monthly basis. Now here I'm showing you the data for 1989, that's a blue line. And for 2009, those are the red dots, uh, but plotted by month. Now you can see that overall the blue line is above the red dots. That's what I showed you previously. That's the overall decline in Arctic sea ice extent, but if you look closely at April, yeah, there is a little red dot that's above the blue line. And yes, for that one month, for a couple of weeks, it was the case that ice had recovered. Now, it takes a lot of effort to find that data point. So this isn't by chance, I don't think. Could be by chance, but I doubt it. It takes a lot of effort to find the one point that goes against the trend line. Now, I did a study on this, and I asked people to tell me what they thought of this kind of interpretation of climate data. And here are the results from my study. This is using a couple hundred undergraduates. Um, and what I did was to show them the data and the statement from the Heartland Institute together, uh, and not just the Heartland Institute, but a whole bunch of other uh, instances. And in one case, I correctly labeled the graphs for what they were. In another condition, I converted this into an economics context. I made up some labels, you know, a trade deficit or inflation or something, and I translated uh, the, the statement verbatim into this other domain, keeping the data the same, uh, just to remove all the politics and the emotion and everything that comes with climate change. 
Now, what you find in both cases, it doesn't matter how I present the data, um, on a scale from one to six, disagree to agree strongly. Very few people thought that the statement was confirmed by the data, but on average, most people thought that the statement was at odds with the data and indeed fraudulent or misleading. And I found that for a number of public instances of such uh, cherry picking where organizations or um, think tanks or dissenting scientists made uh, statements in the media about uh, the climate not changing. In all cases, if you present that to people, they actually discover um, that that was misleading in light of the actual data. So that's something worth keeping in mind, that not everything you hear in the media put forward by so-called skeptics uh, withstands scrutiny in a blind experimental test by people who know nothing about the background of the data. So that was the supply side briefly. Now let me talk about the demand side. What do I mean by that? I mean the, the proverbial person on the street who is um, confronted with these things, information in the media. Let's find out how they think about climate change. How do people think about climate? Well, people think about climate by focusing on things that are utterly irrelevant for the most part. As a first approximation, that is true. That has various implications. One implication is that if people think it's warmer today than on average, they are more concerned about global warming than people who think that today is a cool day. So don't have a climate conference in Copenhagen in the middle of winter. It just doesn't work. It was, I mean, whoever invented that, I cannot believe it. Anyway, uh, that's what people are like. If it's hot today, climate is changing. If it's cold, then it's not. Well, it's a little um, worse than that. This is my favorite study, um, which shows that if you put a dead plant in the lab uh, without any leaves, a tree that died from drought in a pot in the corner of a lab, people believe in climate change more than if there are leaves on that tree. If you want to enhance the effect, you can put three dead plants uh, into the lab, and then people are even more convinced that the climate is changing. Now, it's completely irrelevant, but that is just the species we are. Human beings act on anecdotes, usually not data. Now, that's kind of bad some of the time, but it's also sometimes positive in our context. Uh, for example, when people experience an extreme weather event and interpret that to be a sign of climate change. When they have experienced something like their house drifted down river, then they're likely to think, ooh, ooh, we got a problem, we got to do something about it. So, to sum up, people by and large um, are swayed by irrelevancies if they're not shown the data. This makes it very easy for organized denial, and let's not kid ourselves, there is a lot of that out there. It makes it very easy for organized denial to find traction, unless we're in the middle of an incredible heat wave in Australia or Texas or wherever it is, and um, scientists are willing to draw a connection between that extreme event and climate change. Then the same reliance on anecdotes that characterizes people forces them to uh, draw a connection and become interested in acting on climate change. So, anecdotes aside, how do people perceive data when you actually show them the data? Well, I've already hinted at that because I showed you one study where people were quite good at detecting cherry picking and identifying that as being misleading. Um, now, let me tell you very briefly about one of my own studies that I've done on this. Uh, in the streets of Perth, where my research assistant would accost innocent shoppers and would show them a graph that looked like this or a graph that looked like that. This one 
uh, dressed up as share prices, that one, the actual temperature data, the global temperature data. Um, and I asked people to extrapolate and to tell me where things are going. What's going to happen to the share price? What's going to happen to global temperatures? All people had to do was to tell me, what do you think is going to happen in the future based on the graph? And guess what? What people do is they extrapolate upward, regardless of whether the data were share prices or temperature data. Um, there was, in fact, no difference between the temperature data and the share prices. And what's very interesting is that even though people's opinions about climate change was related to their extrapolation. So the more people believed in climate change, the more they would see them going up in the future when they were temperatures. Even though that was the case, um, even people who completely rejected climate change thought temperatures were going to go up in the future when they were confronted with the data. So in this simple visual task, the data are quite overpowering and even, even though people, those few people who rejected climate science, even for them, uh, extrapolations into the future were positive. So, uh, one message here is that showing people the data, if they're simple and straightforward, is actually uh, potentially helpful. Chris, what's my timing here? Can you? Five minutes. Okay. Then I'll skip over the complex relationships because that's hard to explain because it's complex. Um, let me instead then focus on the last uh, item on my outline here, which is the psychological predictors or what it is that makes people predisposed towards accepting or rejecting climate change. Let me first talk about acceptance by showing you data from one of my recent papers where what I did was to ask people about climate change, the link between HIV and AIDS, and the link between tobacco smoke and lung cancer. And for those three issues, I asked them, tell me how much you believe in this. And I also asked them to tell me out of a hundred scientists working in that area, how many do you think are convinced by the evidence? So I asked my subjects to tell me what they perceive to be the scientific consensus in the community. And the data from that study are shown here. You can ignore most of that, um, especially if you're not an expert in structural equation modeling. Forget all of that, uh, but do look at this single number here. 0.43, which is a correlation between people's acceptance of science and people's perceived consensus among scientists. The two are associated. And crucially, they're associated equally for climate change, lung cancer, and HIV. Climate change is no different from other sciences in this particular regard. Now, an association isn't causation, of course not. However, we've since replicated that basic finding. And in one study that just came out in Nature Climate Change last year, we showed that perception of consensus is, in fact, causal. Because when we inform people about the scientific consensus on climate change in an experiment, telling them that 97 out of 100 climate scientists agree on the basic principles, then this does enhance people's acceptance of climate science. So there is a tool here, and in fact, we can show that this overcomes people's worldviews and political opinions by underscoring the consensus. You can enhance acceptance of climate science. And very briefly to wrap it up, let me go over something that perhaps was already mentioned in the talk last night, which I unfortunately had to miss. And that is that people's rejection of science is based on their own personal worldviews or quote unquote ideology. And in particular, it turns out uh, their belief in the free market. 
Um, the more people endorse the free market, the less likely they are to accept climate science. And what this does is to lead to some very paradoxical results and in interactions with education. In the US, we have data that among Republicans, acceptance of climate science decreases with increasing education level. So whereas 31% of Republicans without a college degree accept climate science, that goes down to 19% with a college degree. The reverse is true for Democrats. So education is not the answer. Neither is um, understanding of the problem. Here are similar data, again from the US, split by Democrat and Republican, uh, where people were asked to self-write their understanding of, of climate science. How much do you know about it? Now, the more Democrats know about climate uh, science by their own account, uh, the more they see it as a threat for the future. With Republicans, the reverse is true. If they understand climate, shine, climate science extremely well, then they're not at all concerned about it. If they don't understand it well, they're a little bit concerned. Note how there are no Republicans who didn't understand uh, climate science in that particular study. So ideology is an overpowering uh, aspect of the rejection of science, and that is where all the reframing and so forth, I think, has to take place. And I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you.